Hey guys, welcome to the Hooked Podcast, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about the Winter Olympics. I'm your host, Kashaj. Here are your other hosts, um, Tanay, Umar, and Hirain. So, Tanay, you want to start us off? So, in 2022, the Beijing Winter Olympics are taking place, but there is a lot of history surrounding this event. For starters, on January 25th, 1924, we saw the first Winter Olympics take place in the French Alps. The multi-sport event featured 16 countries in five different sports, bobsleigh, curling, ice hockey, skiing, and skating. The first Winter Olympics, uh, Winter Olympic Games had 258 athletes, of which 247 were men. However, in 2018, there were 2,900 athletes, of which there were around 1,600 men and 1,300 women. Wow. Well, Karen? I was going to say, wow, there's a... Obviously, there was a big split before between uh, men and women. What do you guys think? Yeah, that definitely tells us a lot about how society and society's priorities are changing, right? With the amount of women that are now coming up in sports. Isn't it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if we look at the if we look at the first Winter Games, I mean, there were just eleven athletes who were women, and two hundred forty-seven were men. So that is a very big disparity. However, if we look back at 2018, the numbers were almost equal. I mean, it was almost a fair split between 1600 and 1300. So that just goes to show how um, sports has changed in, well, the span of, what is it, 96 years or so? Mm. Yeah, that's actually a pretty important point to consider. But it's not just that. Like, originally there were only like a few countries that were in the Winter Olympics and it wasn't really called the Winter Olympics back then and you know those were that was like a really long time ago and people thought different um, back then compared to what they do now and I think like that kind of change is important to consider when you're thinking about the disparity between like the amount of athletes and what it was versus what it is now and I think that it's a good thing for society that there's a bonus opportunity and equality for all. Yeah, you're also saying about the, the Olymp- I think 16, right, number of countries that were participating in the first Olympic Games. Yeah. That just goes to show the amount of um, advantage some of the Nordic and more um, colder countries get when competing in the Olympics because they've got this amount of preparation that they can do all year round. I'm well, not even all year round. Um, for a long time when they were um, coming up as kids, that tells us a lot about the advantages they get. So, um, Umar, I heard you. I heard you refer to Nordic countries. Now, interesting fact about that: while 1924 saw the first Winter Olympics, it wasn't actually the first ever winter sports event, because prior to that, the Nordic Games were first held in 1901 in Sweden. In Sweden, and until 1926, they were held eight times for Scandinavian countries only. So that just goes to show that. Winter sports have gone on for a long time. I mean, that's what, 121 years at this at this stage? While it wasn't a global sport for the Olympics, or while it wasn't a global event for the Olympics, they were still going on before the Winter Olympics first started. You know, we're mentioning all these advantages that countries up north have, but I think like a really interesting exception to this is actually Russia. You know, they've gotten only like a hundred, about a hundred, okay, I can't say only, because I haven't won an Olympic medal, but they got like around a uh, hundred, a little more than a hundred um, overall Winter Olympic medals, which is kind of surprising. I mean, you know, it's not bad, but like you'd expect a country that's so far up north to, that's like constantly snowing, like they'd have a bigger lead in the Olympics than where they are right now. Yeah, I feel like um, Russia definitely really specialized when it comes to stuff like skating because they've got these great facilities in Russia they can use, you know, like these indoor ice skating rinks, you know, hockey rinks, stuff like that. So I think it definitely plays a mass advantage there. But the thing is, when it comes to stuff like skiing, snowboarding, I think it definitely um, gives a great advantage to countries more Western Europe because they've got the advantage of having the Alps in their area, whereas Russia is um, a significantly more um horizontal landscape i guess you could say rather than vertical okay i can say is that um we did bring up the fact that russia might not have been so strong in the i mean the numbers which they receive in the winter olympics is not as staggering as we expect it to be but what we can say is that russia is as an, is an exception in a way because if we look at summer olympic records just something as recent as the 2020 olympics russia earned um, 71 medals in the 
in the Summer Olympics. So, and they placed fifth in as far as gold medal ranking goes. So I think that goes to show that they are an exception in the sense that they both, they, uh, they invest in both the Winter and Summer Olympics. So that's why I guess we can take as far as Russia goes. So what countries do especially well in the Winter Olympics? What type of countries? So um, what we've what we've learned in the past is that, well, specifically Nordic countries do tend to do well. For example, we don't see this much in the Summer Olympics, but then Norway is one of the best, I think, if not one of like the best country as far as medal um, placements go in the Winter Olympics, because I think they're at the top um, with Russia as far as leading countries in the Winter Olympics go. So we do tend to see countries which have a more colder climate be at the top of Winter Olympic rankings. Yeah, and um, if, just to get you guys to the current, I think right now Norway and Sweden are already the top two countries uh, that are leading in the games uh, hosted right now. So do we think um, these colder climate-based countries have a, a greater advantage than more equatorial countries? Or is that just down to facilities, funding, stuff like that? Um, I think that it's mainly down to... I feel like there is a slight advantage to be gained, actually. Like, if you're further up north, right? When you're a kid, you're gonna have access to that snow, that ice, you know, you're gonna build that passion really early on. And you, you compare it to somewhere that's closer to the equator, like, I don't know, I haven't heard Brazil on the Winter Olympics for a long time, but, um... You know, if you have those equatorial countries that don't get much snow and stuff like that, you know, there's like a, the athletes up north are definitely going to have that sort of advantage that, not, I'm not going to say home advantage, but it definitely feels closer to their hearts and childhood. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think for the most part in all sports, it really um, contributes. So like you get people in like, for example, Brazil, they come up playing football, beach football, so they're usually quite skillful. So it all, it all is stemmed from when you're a child, right? What you're brought up doing. So I think that's a major thing when it comes to the colder climates because they have the um, advantage of being able to be raised on these winter sports. Whereas um, equatorial countries, they just don't have that advantage, which is, I guess, life, right? Yeah. You raised the example of Brazil and football, but like, I mean, just, just to like confirm that fact, for example, in the Rio 2016 Olympics, first of all, it was a home uh, climate for Brazil, but then they also went on to win the football gold medal that year. So I feel like, but we also don't see Brazil um, competing very much in the Winter Olympics. So I feel like that just goes to show that certain countries, their placement or their performance in the Winter or Summer Olympics is largely based on their climate at home and that really determines how well they compete or if they compete at all yeah so you talked about home countries how much of an advantage does this winter games give chinese um athletes since it's going to be um um hosted in beijing what do you reckon Shaq? um i actually think that there's definitely an advantage, but it's not going to be as big as you'd have it for like previous years, right? So what I'm talking about or referring to mainly is like the fans, right? So when you go to the host country, chances are most of the stadiums are going to be filled up with like fans from that country. Of course, most of those guys are going to be supporting the team where like, you know, the host country's team. And I think that that's like really important because that kind of pushes the athletes to do better because they know they have all these people like supporting them and pushing them through and it definitely um, um, affects mentally like any Olympic athletes that aren't prepared for that kind of adversity from the fans and, you know you just got to be ready for that but like you know this year they don't have much of that actually they have lockdowns due to COVID so you don't have that big there's definitely still an advantage but it's not as big yeah I think I think I think there's obviously something uh, true about that, but also, like China has the largest population, guys. Like, there's always like some sort of expectation that there's gonna be like, and especially because China does well usually in most of the games. That's what I think, obviously. And um, I think that they do still have the advantage because some countries might have not decided to come uh, to China because obviously of the COVID and 
COVID like circumstances, they would have uh, had to like say no for this year. But China, obviously, they have like the advantage because they're at home, and like most athletes might actually want to come and do the sport. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a massive thing. And Shaq, you talked about the home fans and how that makes a difference. I completely agree. But I reckon it actually um, has a bigger toll on the athletes that are coming into the country because they can't bring any family or friends with them because they're not allowed visitors in the stadium, stuff like that. So I think it has a massive hit on them since they can't, you know, talk to their family, which is a main thing for all these athletes who need someone to talk to, someone to help them with through the um, through the entire Olympic process, which I think is a major thing and something that Chinese athletes do have at their advantage this year. What we can say about that, for example, is I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think China did win the first, um, they did win one of the first gold medals as far as this Winter Olympics goes in uh, ice skating. I think it was a, I think it was a pair of two um, athletes who had won that. So, I mean, they won gold in that. So just, that just goes to show again that like, I mean, they started, I know that Norway is first, but like being the host nations, they have got a good start in this Olympics. So that's also good. That's also a positive side. Yeah, well, hosting I wouldn't... The country, to hosting the games. Yeah, I wouldn't also fully expect China to normally do well in the Winter Olympics since they haven't got... Well, they're, an, they're a more equatorial country, but they haven't got um, sort of the facilities that the Nordic countries might have. So I think it's great that they're competing at this level and they're able to win these gold medals in these events that are normally dominated by mainly European and Western countries. So I think that's great for the sport. It is because um, with the games such as the Winter Olympics, it can be perceived as a very, uh, I guess you could say exclusive event in the sense that, like as we discussed earlier, it seems as if only certain countries can do well in the Winter Olympics because of their climates. But if we see countries out of the blue win uh, medals in sports, which we didn't consider they could win medals for, then that is great for the sport because it, re it removes that um, that idea that it's an exclusive sport which only certain countries or people can take part in. So yeah, it is good for the games. Yeah, you talk about like a one-sided sport. I think the main example that you can take from that is the, the 1988 um, Canadian Olympics with the Jamaican, um, the bobsled team, came on to take eighth overall in the standings for bobsledding. So I think that's a major thing, these underdog stories that can really captivate a world audience because I think the Winter Games might be quite a niche market in terms of athletes. So I think these massive stories that um, go out publicly are great for the entire event as a whole because it encourages more people to take an interest in the Winter Olympics. It does because like when you see certain like underdog stories or stories of people who aren't expected to win and when they turn out winning then it really helps in bringing more of an audience to the sport who can actually like um, make a name for themselves because like we do perceive some sports as um, exclusive sports which not many teams can take part in but if we see underdog stories and you know that gives more of a um, that gives more hope for other countries or other athletes to shine in their field. I think another important angle that we should be looking at this as is like from the fans right you know it's kind of like in basketball when you see the same super team win like three years in a row right it's like really bore it starts to get boring for fans and like it's just kind of predictable and obviously no one wants to watch something where the outcome is predetermined now i think that the olympics suffer from this fallacy less because even though the nordic countries you know they have the slight advantage there's still fresh talent that comes in um, year after year, so I definitely think it suffers less from this problem, but of course it should still be taken into consideration that you want to switch it up with these underdogs every now and then. Yeah, I, th I think I definitely agree with that. Obviously also like throughout the years before like even getting to the Olympics, like obviously athletes can get injured, just like in other sports such as football. If an athlete gets injured before a tournament or a game, then obviously they have to sit out for that one. You know, obviously someone else has to step up and that gives other athletes more chances. Okay, I think moving on for the Olympic Games as a whole, I think we should look at a, um, an individual story. I think Heron has something to talk to us about Sean White. Oh yeah, so Sean White. Uh, Sean White believes this is his bid for a fifth Olympics and also his last one. Trying to become the oldest male Olympic halfpipe rider in the history of uh, Winter Olympics. 
at age 35. He's recently revealed his plans to leave the Olympics. And I quote, after my performance in Korea, I just feel like everything is this awesome bonus situation. He said this last month. And so what White took from the three years off from the high five competition was probably the longest break of his career. And so what this says is like, this is obviously, uh, this obviously shows like an athlete like Sean White, uh, who performs almost consistently in every game. Uh, he always, he always performs well and he's always doing well. And so like after winning three gold medals, it's like, this is like a more of a bonus thing for him because he knows that he just needs to perform at his best and he has to be mentally prepared as he said recently in an interview that now it's not about always doing well because it's just something I have to do and something that I do because that's what my people want me to do it's because it's now more of a mindset thing and so at the age of 19 he already had his five ring debut and so as a three-time Olympic snowboard and gold medalist, he has one of the highest profile uh, profiles out there, and he's ex experienced several extreme incidents throughout the games. Chris, you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I noticed how you mentioned like you know he has to be there mentally and needs to be mentally strong. But I think like you know as you've mentioned, he's getting pretty old now. He's like what? He's in your thirties, as you said. And it's like obviously the mental challenge is important, but if you're physically not able to do it, you know, you might be struggling to compete with all these athletes. Some of these guys are 19, early 20s, you know, they're more robust in terms of health. And, you know, he also suffered those injuries. So I don't know. What do you guys think are his realistic chances of like winning this year? Well, obviously, um, I think there's still a chance because he has the experience. But of course, he's, he's getting older now. And like you said, like, once well, somebody gets older, it's going to be much harder. And obviously, he's also brought up some uh, incidents of back pain. And that makes sense as, as someone grows older and gets to their 40s, back pain must become more uh, of a serious problem. And just in the months leading to like Peng Chang, for like, uh, for an example, um, White crashed during a training and that left him with like facial injuries, which required like what, 62 stitches and like a bruised lungs. But he managed to recover in time to qualify and compete in South Korea. And he took a gold medal that year too. So I think that begs the question, is um, Sean White competing in this Olympics um, hindering the um, improvement of other younger athletes that could take a spot and ensure America has a future in the half-pipe Olympic Games? This is, this is my opinion. I mean, you, um, you guys might differ from this, but I just think that as far as sport teams go, as long as the selection of athletes is right, I think it should just be whoever has the most talent at that time or whoever is best suited for the event should take part in it. Um, because if we if we just take the idea that if that we should be including younger people um, in the teams, then while it's great that you know to give them more chances, more of a chance. It's like if there is someone who's elder but who's older, but if they are a better athlete. I think that that's in a way robbing them. But what do you guys think about this? Do you do, do, do your opinions differ? Um, honestly, I kind of disagree with you there. Um, it's because I think that you know, as long as you got the best person for the job, you know, no matter their age, whoever they are, as long as you know they're certified the best in their country, I think that that's the person who should get the job. And I also know that this can be a little bit subjective because, like. Before you make the Olympic qualifiers, right, where all these athletes are put head to head, you know, different people can have different differing opinions about who's the best, let's say, snowboarder, bobsleigh, or whatever in their country. And honestly, like, unless they go head to head, you won't know. So I think that, like, that kind of subjectivity definitely affects it as well. But as long as you got the best person for the job, I think that's what matters in the end. Yeah, obviously, um, I obviously get what you both got, uh, what both of you are saying. And, um, I'd like to bring up the point that there's two snowboarders, really young. This Chloe Kim at the age of 21, and she's already had her first gold medal in 2018. And she's and she's uh, equally to uh, another sm sto snowboarder whose name is Yuto Tatsuka. And he's Japanese at the age of 20 years, and he's just behind Sean White. And so I think that, I think that as, as snowboarders such as Sean White, 
come older at, at this age of like 35 like obviously it, it's harder because now there are younger athletes that can work in their prime and go equally or better uh and i think in the last games when it was uh uh yuto he was leading sean white for the three game for the first three i think events i think it was something like that uh and it was just in the final few runs where it really matters and that's where sean was just able to make his mark yeah okay i think uh, injuries um moving on to injuries then um well this kind of ties into sean white i guess right because of the amount of injuries that people at especially these type of sports can get um do we think the olympics committee is doing enough to protect these athletes or not um i honestly think that like the there's one important way that you need to look at this through like one lens right and that is the economic standpoint where you had to spend these billions and billions of dollars constructing all these fancy facilities for these athletes i'm sure you guys have seen them on social media and you know all these facilities you know they, they didn't just come out of thin air and I think that it's kind of economical, it's economically terrible if you just set these back and postpone them because you don't know if the Olympics are going to come back to China or what they might do after that. And not only that, but, you know, I understand that, of course, human safety must be first. And, like, of course, human safety, like, I think there was 37 people or so that they said were infected um with covid in terms of olympic staff but obviously you can obviously must uh, value human lives over economic safety but i think that's an important consideration that most people overlook yeah yeah, actually, I... yeah. wait you were gonna say something no go on go on uh, i was just gonna say that in pyeongchang like 376 of the 2000 like 914 athletes they reported injuries over like the 17 day event so like together that was like 12 percent of the athletes or something which incurred like at least an injury and so it just shows like especially like ski half pipes where they had like the highest incidence almost 28 percent yeah i think i think one more thing which we can talk about with the injuries is how much of a um mental effect it has on athletes because if you ask i mean this is this is what i think but if you ask any athlete before the olympics or like in the inter years like what is their main aim they'd probably all be saying to you know win a gold in the olympics but if during the olympics there an event takes place through which they there's a forced injury or if they have to skip on the olympics it's like that's a, that's a big deal because that's what they train for for four years and then for that to just all of a sudden be taken away and like to skip out the whole olympics that is something which takes a toll on them because that means you're forced to wait for four more years if that is even if you get another chance then so injuries do play a big part on an athlete's uh, mental health as well when it when it's um, yeah involving the Olympics. Yeah, I think that's definitely true, and I think I um, I concur with Gustav and what he's saying when these athletes um, know the risk that they're taking with these dangerous sports, and obviously they've come up from a young age doing these sports, well most of them at least. So I think it's really up to them to take all the precautions necessary, and even though. You know they're obviously trying their best to win they need to be they are sensible in a way that they can't they can't and won't hurt themselves i think that's the main thing yeah that's true because like they're you know they're like they they're 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 well aware of the risks which are there when they take part in the sport so i mean it's just about practicing enough or just being ready to take part because it is a big like as far as the olympics go i mean there's some events where you only get one shot and then that's after that one shot it just like that's our end so you know they've just got to be careful with that to you know make sure that nothing bad happens then of course um people's safety should be taken hugely into account whenever you're hosting events like these but um obviously these sort of physical dangers these like physical threats that come in with participating in the olympics it's like you know it's just kind of part of the sport and it's just part of the it's kind of one of the risks that they have to accept when they're pushing themselves to the human extremes. And of course, the Chinese government is doing everything that they can to help ensure safety for not only the athletes, but the staff as well. You know, they've put their entire state into lockdown. There's no fans allowed to in attend. And, you know, that's not an easy decision to make. And they're just doing this to help protect health and safety of the Olympics. 
So that's an interesting point because I was actually thinking about this earlier that in the case, I mean, I know that of course it being the Olympics is a completely different pressure, but with there being no crowds, do you guys think that the actual Olympic performance would just feel like another training session for the athletes? Considering that there's no crowds, I mean, of course it's a it's a it's a huge deal. Like the Olympics isn't just another training session, but I mean, the atmosphere which they're in. Do you guys think that it's in any way similar to training, or like does that help out in um, making sure that the athletes remain calm or undistracted? Um, I think that it's definitely it's nothing like training, honestly, because like you know, for the last four years, these athletes have been preparing for this one moment in their lives, this one day, and that is the Olympics, and that's obviously going to have a huge factor on their overall performance. And it's not only I know there's no physical fans, but you know they still have all the TV cameras pointed at them during the events. You know they're being recorded twenty four seven, and all of that kind of stuff. You know it's all affecting their mental game in terms of that uh in terms of the event i i think i agree with that but at the same time i'd also say like it's more of like a it, it's more more dependent on the athlete right everyone's different we all know that we all have our own ways to deal with things and now that the games are more like they're they're going to be more restricted in terms of like in-person viewing there's still going to be millions of people watching out there on tvs and stuff and so you might see like an increase in the like, cameramen in the actual games uh, in Beijing right now. So there's like that too. There's that aspect of it. We don't know how people see themselves there, but I know Sean White, for example, he sees everything more like as a is a more like a mental battle. So it's like even when he competes every year, he's saying like, even though I have so many supporters here, so many fans from all over the world, it's not really. Them that affects his performance is what is his. It's in his own like mental battle. So like that's some someone like him. It's like a whole different uh, viewpoint. So that that should be considered as well. Yeah, definitely. I think moving on now, the um the big question on everyone's lips. I think St- should the Olympics still go ahead with all the COVID cases around the world, and especially in China, should they actually be going ahead or? Um, is it okay now? Um, of course, you know it's there's still that COVID problem that every country in the world is currently facing. But I personally feel like you know, as I mentioned previously, that economic problem that you got to deal with, you know, is all those that money that you put in. You know, you got to put it to good use, and honestly, that you got to combine with the fact that the COVID case, the situation there, you know, it's bad, but. They're definitely taking good steps to help reduce the problem, you know, I mean, locking down an entire province and, you know, that's just important. They're just making the, their best, um, they're doing the best with the situation that they've been put in. And that's what I'm trying to say. The, these things should be considered, you're right, like, there are many things about um, hosting the Olympics in the current climate, but... I mean, just again, this this is just what um, I do. But if we look at it from the historical viewpoint, I mean, if we look back just 14 years ago, I think yeah, in 2008, the Beijing Summer Olympics were held in China. So they've, in my opinion, I think that they've got some pressure which they've got to live up to as far as those games go to you know make it just as good or to not um, if they've held one um, Olympic Games over there to such a level, they shouldn't they might not want to let it drop again because the Olympics, I mean, they aren't just a new thing, you know, they've been going on for close to a century and a half now. So it's, I mean, when the Summer Olympics got postponed last last year, like that was a pretty big deal. So if they had to, if they were to postpone the Winter Olympics as well, that would be um, quite a staggering event because like, if we look back at when the Olympics have been canceled in the past, I mean, from my memory at least, I think it was just during the world wars and like that just shows that to change the Olympics timing, that's like a very big event needs to take place for that. And that's not saying that COVID isn't a big event, but it's just like, it's canceling the Olympics or postponing it is something which is like a, it's a drastic measure really. So it's difficult to enforce that as well. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, all, and like an extension of what you said, like I feel like 
the Olympics is like it's like a movement, right? It's like something that contributes to building like a more peaceful and like better world. And I think it's also been signed or declared by the UN. I'm pretty sure. Like yeah, so basically all the it, it it's the IOC, right? It encourages like all UN member states to like sign the Olympic Truce thing. And so like I feel like that's the aim every year. And I feel like it's obviously there's also that importance factor of actually having it bringing the communities together. Is one. Yeah, I think that's one thing the Olympics does. Like no matter what, you see problems going on around the world right now. When it comes down to it, in the Olympics, it doesn't really matter. You just get athletes trying their best to represent their country through a sense of patriotism and national national pride, trying to do their best to win some medals. So I think that's one thing the Olympics does well. It puts politics aside and it gets down to the sport, which has to be commended for one thing. Yeah, that's true because like the importance of the Olympics sometimes gets underplayed because like especially after what the last uh, the last two years have shown us it's like an event like the olympics which kind of brings the world together it the importance of that is kind of it's kind of like doubled in this case because it's like people you know you look forward to such an event for a while because um because such things would be put on a hold but if they do take place and that's something which the world can look forward to you know so it is something which unites communities um i actually kind of disagree with you there you know, obviously, uh, the f- main focus of the Olympics should be on the athletes themselves, but recently it's gotten more political. Like, countries have stopped sending their diplomats over to the Olympics. Um, they're still sending their athletes, but, you know, all these kinds of things, you know, they're putting a more focus on the political aspect of the... Well, it's not really part of the Olympics, but the geopolitics is affecting this sports competition which is kind of strange and shouldn't be a part of it i think that's definitely true you, you definitely get that but i think the main the point about the olympics is it's not supposed to be about that and you sometimes get countries taking advantage of this event as um to create political boycotts and political stunts so i think um, in theory, the Olympics should be about um, a sense of international community um, bonding, but in practice, it just um, you don't really get that. Yeah, definitely. And I think also it's also to like resolve conflicts. I think obviously, like whatever happens outside of the Olympics, it's it's different, and like obviously, there's bigger issues out there. But when it comes down to the Olympics, it's it's obviously also a chance for countries to unite together and uh, resolve problems yeah definitely completely agree with that but you don't really see that unfortunately it's what everyone wants but i mean i guess it just doesn't happen because of the international agendas that different countries have around the world so i guess you just don't get that so i think with this like um what we can say is that I mean, the Winter Olympics have, what is it? I think it's 14 days left. It'll end uh, um, next, next Sunday. So I think what we can do is we can see till then to see how the games fare um, out, you know, like who who ends up where, how, um, which countries are on top. And like this Winter Olympics, I mean, it's a very big deal. Um, it's a significant deal as far as the global significance of it. So I think we should just wait and see, you know, how it goes until next next sunday definitely can't wait to see how sean white does um and on that note i think we're going to be ending the podcast here guys thanks for listening um please do tune in next time our current social that we have is hooked podcast h-u-k-t podcast on instagram and we're going to be making more suit so follow that check us out thank you bye-bye